Turn to page 58 for the first number this morning. Very beautiful song it says, He will be with me. It has a great, great message in it. Listen very close to the words as we're singing as well. Everyone join in together. Whosoever may be. For my 
Next song says, take a moment and live. <laughs> what it's talking about is uh, that uh, if you've not been born again, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. It says, take a moment and live. Uh, you're, you're dead if you don't know Jesus Christ. You say, well, I can breathe and all this other, but, but internally you're dead. Your spirit is dead. And uh, this song is a very upbeat song. It says, take a moment and live. Accept Jesus Christ in a moment's time you come alive. That's what it's talking about. Page 26, take a moment and live. song. I really like that. I, uh, I like the, uh, the uh, definition of what it's talking about, though. I mean, it's good to sing, and it's got a lot of, a lot of the, I guess, uh, upbeat to it, but uh, we need to share Christ with everyone we have the opportunity to share Him with. And uh, that's why the song saying, just take a moment and choose Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to turn to page 51 and uh, uh, sing a uh, patriotic song, America. And uh, I... Uh, I don't know, I guess uh, I'm kind of uh, picky a little bit, I guess you could say. Uh, my children, they, they know me very well. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of illustrations real quickly. I went to Cracker Barrel up in Indiana quite a few years ago. And over on the fireplace was the American flag. And uh, you, you've been to Cracker Barrels, you know what I'm talking about. Sitting on the, there around the, the fireplace, they have a, a flag standing there. And uh, I've been there a couple of times before. This time I looked over and the flag was kind of laying against the wall, turned backwards and kind of laying off the side. But there it was. They had the flag there. And uh, not egregious, not rude or anything like that. I asked the, uh, the uh, lady that's waiting at the table, I said, uh, are you aware that your, your flag is displayed in total disgrace? And I said, I didn't say rude to her. Don't miss my point. And she said, no. That's the first thing 
surprised me. She didn't realize that. I said, well, would you ask your manager if he would or she would come and straighten that flag up and pr properly present it? It's going to be displayed. Otherwise, just remove it from the restaurant, you know? Don't, don't, don't let it just lay there like that. And, uh, and again, it's a cordial discussion. It went through. The manager come out and talk to him a few moments and uh, asked me how is the flag supposed to be displayed. We sit there and we talked a little bit. Two or three minutes later, some of the people come out there and they took the flag, they unfolded it, wrapped it, and uh, I don't know, worked with it, finally got it straightened up and stood it up. And she came back over and she said, uh, hey, is that the way it's supposed to be? And I said, yes, ma'am, it looks a lot better. I appreciate you doing that. I said, because if you want to display it, let's display it right. Uh, I went to crack old Charlie's over here uh, about four years ago, was it? Y'all were with me, I believe, I'm not mistaken. And uh, you go in the old opening there in the old Charlie's restaurant, and they have a little counter there where they uh, receive you in and seat you. Off the side there, there used to be a flag there, I assume it's still there. Uh, it had something in front of it, and it was turned up backwards and was laid against the wall as well. Uh, I asked the lady there again, very, very politely, I wasn't rude or anything like that. I said, uh, would, would you man, mind talking to your manager, see if y'all can straighten the flag up, and at least just, and by the way, that was the weekend the 4th, by the way, that we was there. I said, would you straighten the flag up and at least display it in proper order? I said, it's, the way you got it hanging there is it's referred to as being hanging in disgrace. And you need to really straighten it up or else just remove it, you know. They, 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 she went and got her manager. They didn't come over and ask me anything. They got in a little group over there and they talked for a few minutes. A few minutes later, I seen them go get somebody else. They come over and talk for a little bit. A few minutes later, they went and got somebody else. They come over. By this time, there's probably, what, seven or eight people gathered around this flag talking to one another. And finally, one of them said, How's it supposed to be? That just, I mean, I'm being honest with you, I, I don't understand that. I do not understand that. Uh, somebody said, well, you know, and I, I agree, we, we're here for Christ. God gave us this country. And that's, that's the thought of our country. And I say this very respectfully. I go to church after church after church. That's in the restaurants I talk about. We was in a church a few nights ago and I punched my, my I think Margaret was with me. I said, be great. I believe she's there with me. I punched her. I said, look at the flags. Number one, they're on the wrong side. Number two, they're turned backwards. Uh, I say that respectfully in a way of speaking, but in another way I say it's very, very egregious that our people that are here in this country, that God has gave us this country, don't even understand how to respect their country. And that's just one of the many ways. And you'll see me straighten these flags up very often up here. Uh, I'm very, very committed to that because that flag is just as important as this flag. Look at the colors. You notice the same colors on them? You ever notice that the red, white, and blues on both them flags? They both represent pretty much the same thing, but the men and women gave their life for us to have this one. Jesus Christ gave his life for us to have that one. There's a respect in both categories. And I thank God for that. And I thank God that I am a patriot. I'll tell you right now, I am a patriot. I don't mean a patriot like those who go out there and fight everybody. I mean I'm a patriot because I thank God that he gave me this country. He gave me the right to live here. And we're blessed beyond measure. And we spit in his face every time we turn around, including what he gave us. Uh, I think it's time that God's people... Uh, actually started standing up for the things that are right. I don't mean going out and fighting battles. I mean just do what's right. Just do what's right. And it's amazing how this country might change. As we sing this song this morning, I hope and pray that you can sing it and it'll mean something to you. It means something to me, I'll tell you. It means something to me. It wouldn't join in. My country is of the sweet
going to sing a couple songs this morning. The first one's called Honest Offering. Sometimes we think we have to get it all, our act together before we can come to God, and He wants us just as we are. He uses us as we are. So we come to Him broken and messy, but He just wants an honest offering. He just wants us to surrender where we are, and He'll change us and use us and make us new.
what he did for us on the cross. This next song tells the whole story about how Jesus died for us and it just says praise the name. So this is your opportunity this morning just to get your heart right before the message and just to use this time to worship the Lord. Yeah.
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. I warn you, I'm going to have a pretty long introduction this morning. Um, but then we'll, we'll get, into, into the, get to the scripture, and, we'll, and it'll be about halfway through the message. But this morning, um, as we prepare to celebrate the 4th of July, thinking about our nation, th as we prepare to celebrate the American Revolution, I've entitled this message, A Blue Collar Revolution. A Blue Collar Revolution. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. And, and if you would, please go ahead and stand one more time as we read this together. We're standing in honor for God's Word which is everything, which is our foundation, which is the truth, which is the light that shines in this dark world, which is the hope that we have. It is through God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, through His Spirit, through His Word that we have hope. So we stand to honor that. Just like we stand for the flag, we stand, we have to stand to honor the Word of God. There, we wouldn't have this nation or any other nation without the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. It says, For you see your, your calling, brethren... How that not many noble, excuse me, you see your, your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And if God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in His presence. Let's Lord in prayer together. Father, thank You for Your Word, the power of Your Word, the revelation, the truth. God, we would, our, our view is so distorted of everything. As sinners, as those affected by rebellion against You, it has distorted how we see everything. The fall, we think about falling. It's like we have fallen from a great height and we have spiritually. And God, it's resulted in spiritual death as Bill described earlier. And, it's, and it has uh, turned into a spiritual blindness and a spiritual distortion where we do not see things as they really are. But we're so thankful for your word that shows us the right way to see, that gives us the truth. We live in such a chaotic time, such a deceptive time. Where we hear a lie, then we hear a complete contradiction of that lie, but it's also a lie. A lie on both sides. God, we're so thankful for your word, which is straight and narrow and sure that we can build our life upon it. It is the standard. You are the standard by which everything else is judged. You are the standard of truth, of reality, of righteousness, of right and wrong. You are the standard. And God, we thank you for, for you as that standard in our life, and we thank you that you have revealed yourself through your word that we can have that standard to live by and to judge everything else by, that right way to see not our opinions, not our views, not ourselves, but you and your word. So God, thank you, Lord, for this time together here this morning. We pray your blessing upon this time, upon each person here, each family represented, our community, our society, our nation. We pray for your blessing, God, and for your help. Help us, God, to be obedient to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Probably the best way to describe the things that I'm thinking on these days, and as you all know, I mean, you're my church family. We've talked about so many things. You know I've got a lot of stuff going on in my mind right now, a lot of major life decisions, things that are going on in my life and Jana's life, and our family, our church family here. I think the best way to describe what I'm thinking on these days, what's on my mind all the time, what's on my mind constantly is this. It is counting the cost. I would say, I'm, I'm trying to climb up as high as I can to see the spiritual horizon around me, as far as I can see. And I've been looking at this, it's not something new that I'm looking over these things, but it's, it's certainly expanded. Where it, It's been global. It's been national. It's been communal. It's been, it's been our, our church here. It's been that way, but now it's, it's intensified to where I'm looking even more closely, both here at home, but also abroad. And just looking at everything, looking at the landscape, looking at where, where is our world at? Where is our nation at? Where is our church at? Where... 
Where are we at today? Where am I at? Where are you at? It's taking inventory, and I would say the best way to describe it is I'm counting the cost. Because I see things that are troubling. Just I know you do as well. And I'm asking the question, what's it going to take? I, don't, I, I cannot stand pessimism and cynicism. We just look at stuff and just see all the problems, see all the bad. Okay, great. Okay, complain. Why? That's fine. Yeah, we can see the problem. What's the solution? If you, if you can, all you can do is just point out problems, do me a favor and stop talking. Next. Who's somebody with a solution? Okay, that's why I want us to be thinking. I hate a defeatist mentality. If you have a defeatist mentality, you need to get saved. No Christian can have a defeatist mentality. If you're a defeatist, you don't have no clue who Jesus is. I don't care how much you think you know. But I'm counting the cost and I'm asking the question, what is it going to take? I look abroad. I look overseas. And this isn't new to anyone who's ever been here. Billions of unreached people, hundreds of millions... Billions, that's thousands of millions of people who need the gospel. I mean, that's staggering to see. It's, it's hard to get your mind around. I like one guy, a guy I've been listening to, I've been listening to a lot of different mission things recently. You know, that should, something about that should bother us. Because if I didn't have the gospel, let me be more specific. If I didn't have Jesus, this may just be a weekend thing for you. It may just be a tradition for you. It's not for me. If I didn't have Jesus, I would not even want to live. I, would, I wish I never even existed. If I didn't know Jesus. And there are people who don't know him and they can't know him there's nobody even there to tell them our whole ministry you think about our life and every Christian is to be a minister all of us I'm going to talk more about this in a minute we can encourage people come to church come to God's house read God's word you must know Christ we can share tracts we can share the gospel but imagine if there was just there was no church to go to Jesus is worthy of more than that. For God so loved the world, not just this nation. He loved the, Jesus is worthy of the whole world. And he's got about less than two-thirds of it where he's been presented. He deserves, he deserves the 1040 window. He deserves the Middle East. He deserves Asia. That belongs to him. All power and authority is given to him. That's his, those are his continents. Those are his regions. Those are his nations. But beyond that, I think about, I heard a guy say this week, no, and we are so saturated. We, we swim in the ocean of the gospel here in East Tennessee. I heard this guy say this, he's exactly right. No one deserves to hear the gospel twice until everybody's heard it at least once. That's the truth. But we have a selfishness here where we say, who cares about them? Forget them. It's about me. What am I going to get? Jordan, you leave and go to another country. What does that do to me? I want to vomit. At that, I don't, I don't want to say I disagree with that mentality. I want to vomit on this stage at that mentality. The selfishness has to end. It has to end. We think that we're selfless. We're not. We think I'm selfless. I'm here. I'm spending my beautiful, sunny Ju July Sunday morning in God's house. I'm a martyr. And by our cultural standards, you are. But you're not by this standard. God has done so much for us. Christ has done so much for us. We've got to stop being selfish. We've got to stop putting ourselves at the center of everything and put Christ at the center. 
Nobody deserves to hear the gospel twice, but everybody's heard it once. And we have to be committed for the gospel to spread throughout this world to all of us. The Great Commission is not just to me, it's to us. And the Great Commission is not to make disciples, and it is not to teach. It is to teach all nations. It is to make disciples of all nations, and that's to you. What are you doing about it? What am I doing about it? Because, and you better think about it. You may say, well, I don't care. I don't have to do anything about that. You're going to die one day, and you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, and he's going to say, what did you do with the commission that I gave to you? I want us to be challenged by this. I'm challenged by this. I look abroad. I see billions of unreached people who need the gospel. And, I, I, and it seems impossible. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But it seems impossible. It seems insurmountable. But then God gives me a vision and says, it's not. In my lifetime, billions can hear the gospel before I die of old age if God allows me to live. Within the next 20 to 30 years, the whole world can hear. And I'm not the only one that's seen this. I'm not the only one the Holy Spirit has revealed this to. And it, and it is so brilliant and glorious because it didn't come from the internet. It didn't come from missiologists. It didn't come from surveys. It came directly from Jesus Christ. We just happened to forget it. It seems insurmountable. It seems impossible. It's not. But what will it take? It will take exponential growth. Oh, what? I don't ask that question rhetorically. Oh, but what would it take? How many? It takes exponential growth. I'll answer your question in two words. Exponential growth. You know what that means? No converts. Not one convert. Only disciples. There's an enormous difference, and this church needs to learn the difference. There's a difference between a convert and a disciple. I believe at 10 years old I was converted to Christianity, but I didn't really become a disciple. I'm talking about being a follower of Christ. I'm talking about one who's been mentored by Christ, been mentored by other believers, to where they can mentor others. I'm talking about a mature believer who is sharing the gospel with others, who is sharing the word of God with others, someone who truly knows Christ and is helping others come to know him. I'm talking, I'm talking about people who have the gospel flow to them, the dead branch we keep talking about in John 15, but the gospel flows through them. I receive the gospel, I hear it, I know it, I, the word of God, I hear it and I know it, but then it flows through me to somebody else. That's what I'm talking about. And it flows through me to them, then it flows through them, through, through me to two other people, flows through that person to two other people, flows to that person through two other people. It's exponential growth, and it reaches the world in our lifetime. Starts off slow, but man, does it explode. Ten years in, twenty years in, and it's how Jesus did it. He just taught teachers. He just mentored mentors. He just made disciples who could make disciples. He spent three years making disciples. He said, come, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Three years. He trained them and taught them. He, died, he did other things too. He did the, most, the greatest thing, dying on the cross to be the Savior of the world. But how's the world going to know? He's gonna, they're going to find out through these disciples. At the beginning of his ministry, he says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. At the end of his ministry, he says, now, all power and authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Now you go make disciples. Do what I just did. The method. Take the message that a Savior has come, the Savior of the world has come. Take that message, and you use my method. We've abandoned his method. That's why billions have not heard. That's why our nation is in the sewer. We abandoned his method. Now, we can't go back and change that. I wish I could. But I can repent. Today's a new day. And I think we can take the nation back. And I think we can see the world evangelized in our lifetime. I think we can see disciples made throughout the world. Here's the thing. Not everyone's going to be saved, but they'll have the opportunity. It'll be presented to them in a way they can understand it. Not in confusion, not in false teaching, not in some prosperity gospel, the true gospel. If they reject it, they reject it. My job is not for them to accept it, but my job is to present it. Your job is to present it, and we can. I'm incredibly hopeful, but some things are going to have to change. Some people are going to have to change. As I look abroad, I see that. 
Making disciple makers. Making disciple makers. Making disciple makers. Say that with me. Making disciple makers. One more time. Making disciple makers. That's the key. That's what Jesus did and what he trained his disciples to do, to make disciple makers. That's the answer. That's what it will take. That's what it will cost. But simultaneously, I'm looking around here at home. I'm seeing dying churches. I talk about this in Sunday school class. The church is shrinking. The church is dying in America. I could talk all morning about that phenomenon and what, what's contributing to it. But I'm asking the same question. What will it take? What will it take to turn things around? To come back out from the chaos and the rebellion against God? Is it even possible? I raise this question Wednesday night, or is it too late? What's it going to take to turn things around? What's it going to cost? Now, I'm just like you, and I've thought this way for years. I have, um, maybe you're like me, you've hope, you hope and you pray that maybe one great sermon could just turn everything around. And I want you to understand, God, is, His hand is not short and He cannot save. He can, he can do anything He wants. There have been times, read the book of Jonah, Nineveh was a godless, rebellious, blasphemous nation. Jonah walked in, Nineveh, the, the Assyrians, Jonah walked in, preached the message, the whole city of 180,000 people repented. One message, one prophet. You hope and you pray for one great sermon. One great message that turns the nation back to God. Think about Jonah in the Old Testament. Think about Jonathan Edwards. His sermon centers in the hands of an angry God. In our day and age, you think about it with, with internet, a message that goes viral and really impacts people and turns the nation back to God. That could happen. I hope and pray that it does. But it sure hasn't happened, has it? Or maybe one great event it was referenced in Sunday school class this morning. You think about Pearl Harbor. Now that didn't, that stopped short of what I would like to, maybe it did somewhat accomplish what, I, what you would hope to see. Pearl Harbor or 9-11, some event that shakes us back into our senses and unifies us. But I sure hope it goes beyond what we've seen where, you know, it, Pearl Harbor unified the nation. The nation was not going to go into World War II. Pearl Harbor happened, we were attacked, now we're going to World War II. World War II is probably lost by the Allies if that event doesn't happen. It solidified the nation, it unified the nation to say, let's go. We're going to war. We're going to start with Germany, we're going to finish with Japan. We're going to war. We were going to stay out of it. It was going to be, America was going to be neutral, we were going to stay out. We're separated by oceans, we won't know part of it. Pearl Harbor happened, that was the only reason we went into World War II. Public sentiment changed. I want it to go way beyond that. Not just where we, we get unified politically or in our, um, our, our political views or something like that or our economic views. I want it to, to bring about repentance and turning back to Jesus Christ. Hopefully going beyond that to repentance and faith in Christ. Anything short of that will not work. So one great sermon, one great event, or maybe so, one great man, somebody like a Martin Luther, a John Wesley, a D.L. Moody, a Billy Graham, that can preach and, and turn the nation back to God. A national revival. You know, you know, by the way, there's a secular version of this. You know what it is? It's called a presidential election. We're not looking for a president. We're not looking for a chief executive officer for the country. We're looking for a savior. How's that going? Just one man, one woman, one person who can turn this whole thing around. That's what we desire. Both Christians and non-Christians, that's what we're looking for. How's that going? I would say it's going miserably, and it, is, and it hasn't happened.
I think all of us would love, I, I just want to see that happen. I think all of us probably truly desire for that to happen. But I'm afraid that part of why I desire that to happen and you desire that to happen, why we desire that to happen that way is because it requires nothing from me. Yes, someone should preach that sermon. Yes, someone should be that person. Yes, that event should happen, but it doesn't require anything from me, and it doesn't require anything from you. Maybe, and it could happen in a day, or a year, or four years. It would be quick. Quick and easy. We, 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 we really do. We do want a solution. And we also want it to be quick and easy. Quick and easy. Um, I gave you those three words, making, disciple, makers. I'll give you three more. Quick and easy. I think quick and easy is why we're in the mess we're in. Because I, I, I want to see transformation. I want to see my family, my friends come to know Christ and be mature believers and see their lives transformed and, and their friends and family and their lives transformed. But that, I want it to happen quick and easy, and it doesn't happen quick and easy. I think quick and easy is why we're in the mess that we're in. That's two of our favorite words in America. I really believe we can see our society changed and transformed for Christ. But I'm, I'm almost certain it will not be quick and easy. And it will require something from each one of us. It will require something from you. And it's going to require something from me. And here's the thing. I know you've already given yourself an exception in your mind because that's what we do in church. You, nobody gets an exception. Nobody gets an exemption. It will take, I can assure you this, I will not change this nation. I will not change our community. I will not change our society. I will not change a, a different society, a different nation. I know that. I cannot do it. You cannot do it. But we can do it. I believe we can see our society changed, our workplaces changed, our homes transformed by Christ. But it will not be quick and easy, and it will require something from each one of us. In fact, and this is where things begin to break down, it will require everything from us. And here's the thing, we just spent some time singing it. I surrender all. We just sang over and over again, Jesus, you can have it all. You can have it all. Jesus, you can have it all. We're going to have to mean what we're singing. And that's what, and it's not just based upon a song lyric, but Jesus said, unless you hate your father and mother and, and, and money and houses and lands and your own life also, you cannot be my superstar, nation-changing preacher. No, you cannot be my disciple. He's got to be number one. He has to have it all. We really have to surrender all. We have to do what we sing that we're doing. It will require everything from each one of us. Just like Jesus tells us in his word over and over and over again. So we come to the passage this morning thinking about this. And I raise a question. Jesus, who, who was he born to? In what family was he born? 
Who is he born to in this world? When, you, when the Son of God, mind-blowingly, he's going to, the Creator is going to enter his creation. To whom is he born? He's born to Joseph and to Mary. What was Joseph's profession? He's a carpenter. And you know, actually, that's a pretty, that's actually a broader term. He was a laborer. He was just a laborer. Him and his young wife, they were peasants. You, I mean, they were nobody. Why was he born to them? He can, you understand, why not the high priest? I mean, if the Son of God is going to take on flesh and dwell among us, and is going to be born into this world, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, if that's going to actually happen, which is, I can't even get my mind around it to this day, studying it for 30 years, to whom will he be born? The high priest? What about a Pharisee? What about a Sadducee? What about a member of the, of the Sanhedrin? What about John the Baptist was born to, to a priest? Zacharias? Why was Jesus born to a carpenter? To two peasants? You could say, now, as Kitty's going over in the theology program, that's a narrative. It doesn't, we don't have a teaching for that. It just tells us this is what happened. So maybe it was just a coincidence. It's time to call some apostles. Who does Jesus choose? Mostly fishermen, a tax collector. We don't even know the background of the other guys. Um, a zealot, a political fanatic. I'm going to ask again, why not a Pharisee? Why not a Sadducee? Why not a scribe? Why not a lawyer? Why not a member of the Sanhedrin? Maybe it's just another coincidence. I don't think it is a coincidence. Jesus could have called, and actually that's the most natural choice. They've got large portions of the Old Testament completely memorized. They've devoted their lives to the Word of God. And he walks right past them and chooses fishermen. Jesus was well aware of, of, of who the candidates could be. He walked right past the highly qualified, and he got fishermen and a tax collector, a bunch of nobodies. Why? I think we have the answer. Because God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Well, why would he want to do that? So that no flesh should glory in his presence. Because it's not about them. It's about him. And here's part of what I'm seeing as I'm looking at this landscape. Today in the church, we have become wise and mighty. Do you think that's a problem based upon this passage? In the church, we have become wise and mighty. If you pastor any size, any church of any size, a larger church, you have to have a doctorate degree. A PhD in theology, a doctorate of ministry, it, drive up and down the, the roads. Any church, I would say of about 200, 250 or larger, you read that sign, it has to say, doctor, fill in the blank. With very few exceptions. Professionals. Church is run by professionals. Any church of any size, you know, we're a little nobody church, but any church of any size, musicians, professional, uh, vocalists, professional, we have become wise and mighty. I thank God for seminary. I'm not against seminaries. 
And there are some very humble men and women who have, who have a, a, an insatiable hunger for the Word, and they understand there are men and women in seminaries who have dedicated their whole life to the study of the Word of God. And it's not to, not to get notoriety. Yes, they've achieved those degrees, but it's because they, they've devoted their whole life. They love the Word of God so much, they're going to devote their whole life to just studying this Word. And praise God if someone would pay them to do that. Praise God for that. They are the minority. I'm telling you from the inside, the majority want a piece of paper on the wall to say, I'm qualified. I can now be paid this amount. Oh, I got more qualified. This amount. Pay me this amount or I'll go to another church that will. That's what's happened. If you think I'm wrong, talk to me after the service. Again, I'm not against education. I'm going to say more on that in a moment. But that's what's happened. The church has turned into big business. And you have the professionals. And I used to say you've got, I used to, I would have said, well, you've got the professionals up there, and we're the amateurs back here. But we're not even the amateurs. You're a spectator. Amateur means you do something at a lower level. You don't do anything. The, the church, I can't imagine it becoming any more passive than it is. How passive can you get? All right, it's a good service. A great sermon, Jordan. Passive. And that's not just big, that's this church too. Very passive. Um, that is, that is, that's been the church for the last 200 years has been growing in passivity. Spectators viewing the professionals do what they do and very much not what we do. The church has become as passive as it can possibly be. And what I'm saying this morning is... We've, it's, it's so much so we actually kind of laugh about that. And we call it the 80-20 rule. That 20% of the church does 80% of the work. As churches are dying and closing their doors, I mentioned this in Sunday school class, do you know there's never been more mega churches than there are today? What's a mega church? These are Christian churches. This is, this is within Protestantism, within Christian churches. What's a mega church? 2,000 or more. 2,000 or more people. We don't really have any of those in Blount County. We have maybe a few in Knoxville. A mega church. There's never been more mega churches than there are today. And you talk about passivity. You talk about spectators. I would say that's a 95-5 situation where 5% are the only ones qualified to be up here to, to speak. Everybody else is a spectator. It's very efficient. It's very American. Just consolidate, consolidate. Why are we maintaining all of this? Let's just join in with another church. And they join in with another church. Let's just go to Neyland Stadium. Let that be the first Baptist church of East Tennessee. The best preacher, the most articulate, the most educated, the best scholar. Put him on the stage. Put the, put the ten best musicians and singers. And then, and then the other 107,000 can just watch. And there are people, we, we might as well think that way. Because that's where we're headed. But no spiritual gifts are being used by anybody. And everything is as passive as it can possibly be. And I'm not going to do anything because I'm not a professional. We say things like, oh, you ought to talk to my pastor. You go tell your best friend. You go tell people with whom you have such a close relationship. Oh, you should go talk to my pastor. They don't know your pastor. They know you. They don't love your pastor, they love you. They don't need your pastor, they need you. Satan has completely blinded the church to where all of this is perfectly acceptable. It's not perfectly acceptable. And we're reaping what we sow. And we can't go back and we're going to continue. What I'm talking about isn't going to fix anything tomorrow. We're going to continue to reap what we've sown. What I'm talking about is we've got to start sowing differently and when I stand up here and I plead and I cry, I plead with you. You have to become a disciple maker. 
You, that's why I keep saying, make disciple makers. You have to be a disciple who makes disciples who makes disciples. Or we're going to lose. And the church in America is going to go away. We need disciple makers. Every Christian, a minister. Doesn't mean you're going to be ordained. Doesn't mean you're going to be called to the office of pastor or of deacon or that you're going to teach a Sunday school class, but you're going to be a teacher, a mentor, a minister of whoever God puts in your life. A maker of disciple makers. What's it going to take? What's it going to take to see a change? It's going to take 100%. It's going to take the body of Christ being the body of Christ. We can't pay someone else to do it anymore. We can't just put our money in the plate, pay him. That's your job. Studying the Bible is your job. I'll come and listen to what you studied on this week so I can learn something. Consolidate it. Make it easy for me. I'll give you an hour. All that has to be crucified. The 80-20 rule has to go be, be hung on the cross and crucified. But the, it's not just the national 80-20 rule amongst, amongst Christians in your life. It has to be crucified. You've got to get engaged. You have to get engaged, and you have to make disciples. You have to be obedient. The Great Commission is not new. It's been around our entire lifetime, but we're going to have to actually do it. The body will have to be engaged. The 80-20 rule will have to be crucified. On Wednesday nights, starting this week, I've got a very simple two pages, how to do it, scriptures to use, how to sit down, with, and this is not a Bible study. It's called a dis discovery Bible series. It's how do you sit down with one other person, maybe two, maybe three, not above three. This is not a Bible study. This is not a big classroom. This is not a lecture. It's just two or three guys, two or three ladies sitting together, opening God's Word. You begin with the question, what are you thankful for? You follow that up with the question, what are you struggling with? Third question, who can we help? Who's somebody around us needs help? Let's pray for them. Maybe we can do something to help that person. You spend some time talking about that, then you get God's Word out, and you read it. You read it carefully. One person, you say, put that in your own words, what we just read. Let's read the creation account. Put that in your own words. Just tell me like you tell somebody on the street. Then you read it again. Say, what does this tell us about God? You read it again. Talk about that a little bit. Then you say, what does this teach us about, about, what does this teach us about God, about Christ? You read that together. Then you move down and let's read it one more time with the thought of what does this teach us about ourselves? What does this teach us about man? Then you roll to the next one and say, well, who can you share this with? Or who could you maybe... Understand, this is not just about the people who are sitting in that room on Wednesday night. This is about sharing it with you so you can go share it with somebody else. That's the critical element. This isn't flowing to you. It's flowing through you. It is so simple. It's so basic. Just sit down with other people. And as you're talk the first time you talk with them, you're already talking about who can you share this with. Let me tell you what happens in other nations where, they, where we've not, they've not been trained the way we have in churchianity on how we don't have to obey Jesus. Let me tell you how this works in other countries. Missionaries go into a village. They go meet with a lady who's a Muslim. And they go and they share with her a story from God's Word. They share with her the story of Zacchaeus. And they say, okay, Muslim lady, I'm going to come back and in a week. I want you to have shared what you... Uh, share, that, share the story of Zacchaeus. The story of Zacchaeus... You can get saved just hearing the story of Zacchaeus. That's all you knew. You share the story of Zacchaeus with a lady. You talk about it, discuss it, see if she has any questions. Have her retell it to you. I'll be back in a week. I want you to have shared this with five other people. She's a Muslim. Missionary leaves, comes back. Who'd you share it with? If she says no one, say, okay, I appreciate that. Let's pray together. Thank you for your time. But I'm going to have to move on. Because if it's going to stop with you, we're done. There's too many people lost. But you know what? That doesn't happen. You go to this lady and say, who did you share it with? Did you share it with five people? She says, no, I didn't. I shared it with 25. 
And actually, number 23, my cousin down here, uh, down here in this other village, he said that he, he th he's kind of like Zacchaeus. He needs somebody to forgive him. He might need Jesus. Can we go talk to them? Muslim lady and missionary go walk down together to share the gospel. This guy gets saved. All he knows is Zacchaeus. Now we got this little Bible study going. You know what? It won't be long. This lady says, you know, now that you mention it, I've done some bad things. You think I can be forgiven? You think Jesus can forgive me? I'll repay the stuff I've done. I'll go back and apologize. And before you know it, a little group is we're making disciples who make disciples. Before you know it, there's a church in that village. Before you know that church has grown so much, they're saying, I've got to go tell somebody else this. And they don't know. Do you know how much we know? Do you have any idea how much we know in this room? But we don't share any of it. Do you understand how little they know, but they share it? That's what I'm talking about. You know what? Later on, you find out, well, they're getting a lot of resistance. They're, people tell them, I'm going to kill you if you come back to this village. Well, I guess that's that. And they say, well, we're going to go back. What do you mean you're going to go back? They said they'll murder you. They say, maybe, oh, you probably hadn't read it. Where was that at? It may take them an hour to find it. Matthew 28. Jesus said, Go. So I've got to go. I've got to go back. I don't have a choice. Christ told me to go. I have to go. And they go get martyred. But then something happens in that village. What am I talking about here? Aliens? I'm talking about Christianity. I'm talking about... Um, when they learn the new song and say, Jesus, you can have it all, they mean it. You can have it all. Oh, by the way, when that Muslim lady did become to faith, her family disowned her. Well, didn't Jesus say somewhere in here, if you love father and mother and brother and sister and wife and houses and lands and your own life also, you can't be my disciple? He told me that would probably happen. Let's pray for my family. Folks, this is what I'm talking about. As we stand, as we close, I'll give you two more scriptures here. We need disciple makers. That doesn't mean you stand up on a stage. There are people in this room, I promise you, you're not called to stand up here on this stage. And that's fine, but you're called to be a disciple maker. But there are people in this room who do need to be up here. You understand we have a shortage of pastors? We're about to have a pastor, a crisis of pastors. And part of that reason is we think you have to have a Ph.D. I thank God for seminary. You do have to know the Word, but you don't have to have a Ph.D. And in fact, I know men with a high school education who know the Word of God better than men who have Ph.D.s. You know why? Because they love the Word. But you do have to know your stuff. Understand there's a ditch on both sides. You can turn this into this professional CEO, you know, white-collar mentality. But you can also say, well, I'm just going to get there and say the first thing God puts in my mind and be lazy and not study. Let's go to the next scripture, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study. This is Paul who was, who was an extraordinary educated man, but he also told the Corinthians, I didn't know anything but Christ and him crucified when I came among you because it's not about my knowledge, not about my education. Timothy was a nobody. In fact, he was, his dad was a Greek, so he couldn't even go to synagogue. He couldn't go, to, the, he couldn't go to, to Torah school. He didn't know anything. He was a nobody from nowhere. But God called him to be a pastor. But along with that, even though he was a nobody from nowhere, God expected him to know the Word of God. This is what, Timothy, this is what Paul writes to Timothy. Study to show thyself approved, not unto men, but unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. You have to know your stuff. That doesn't mean you need a formal education, you need a degree on the wall, but you have to know your stuff. We need, I think God may be calling men in this room to become pastors, and we need them. We've got to produce leaders. We can't just keep stealing from this church or that church. If this church can't produce leaders, it needs to go away. Leaders need to be raised up within this congregation. We've done that. We can't stop doing that. We need to be able to send out. This church should be producing not a pastor here or there should be producing over the next 10 years dozens of pastors to go out and pastor churches to spread this. If you're here this morning, God's dealing with you. 
I think we need a blue collar revolution. And this isn't new. I can go back 500 years. A guy named William Tyndall. That was very much the mentality of leave it to the professionals, the priest. Leave it in Latin. You're too dumb to even read it. You wouldn't understand it. You go to the priest, you go to the expert. Folks, we're headed back that way. We need to repent of that. And we need to study the Word of God. William Tyndall was one of those educated men. He was a theologian. He was a translator. And he began to read the Word of God, read Erasmus, the, the, the New Testament in Greek. And he began to realize what the church is saying is not what the Word of God says. I'll, I'll give you this quote. This is from a sermon John Popper did about William Tyndall, a theologian, brilliant man, linguist. God uses brilliant people, but it's not because they're brilliant. William Tyndall, 1494, 1536. He died at 40 years old. I'll tell you why in just a minute. Increasingly, as Tyndall saw the Reformation truth more clearly in the Greek New Testament, he made himself suspect. So he, he, people started noticing, hey, wait a minute, this guy's saying some stuff we don't like. He made himself suspect in the Catholic house of John Walsh. John Fox tells us that one day an exasperated Catholic scholar at dinner with Tyndall said, we are better to be without God's law than the Pope the Pope's law. In response, Tyndall spoke his famous words, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, there are many years. I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the scriptures than thou dost. This is not new. You can know the word of God. You can preach the word of God. God's calling people, men to pastor just ordinary men. Nobody's from nowhere. That's what we need. But they love the Word. This church has been like an experiment. We have no paid staff. I'm not paid. Justin's not paid. Bill's not paid. Jake's not paid. No paid staff. This is a blue-collar church. But it can become more of a blue-collar church. I wondered when we started this 12 years ago, can it work? You know why I preach? I love the Word of God. I should pay you to preach the Word of God. I love the Word of God. It's not about money. A passion for the Word. We need men with a passion for the Word. Folks, we're compromised. We have got to repent. We've got to come back from this way of thinking. And we have to make disciple makers. We have to raise up leaders within the church. We can't just keep sitting back saying, it needs to be done. Let somebody else do it. We have to do it. We have to do. If God's dealing with you this morning, you need to come and pray. This altar's open. As we sing this together, this song is called Reckless Love, about what Christ has done for us. What am I willing to do for Him? He's done everything for me. I should be willing to do anything for Him. As we sing this together, listen to the words of this. This is between you and God at this time. God's speaking to you.